Hi, this is Kevin Trainer, and welcome to my lecture for Chapter 5 of Maroc's third edition MySQL book. Chapter 5 is, is about how to insert, update, and delete data. And uh, let's get started. As usual, I'm going to leave you to read the objectives on your own. Okay, before we start, I just want to put this... Uh, uh, the content of uh, Chapter 5 into perspective. Uh, so far, we have in Chapters 3 and 4, we've gone through uh, how to do uh, queries using the SQL select statement to get uh, answers about the contents of the database that are going to allow us to uh, do things in our uh, business or professional lives. Okay, so we start with a database that's already populated. Okay, and then we say, well, how can we how can we extract answers from it? Okay, and we'll learn about other features for extracting answers. But now we finally got to the question: Well, how did that data get into the database? Okay. And um, primarily the statements in SQL that uh, have an impact on the content of the database are the insert, the update, and the delete. Okay. Now, it turns out that they start the chapter here to, to, talking about alternatives to insert, like create table. Okay. Now, I'm not sure I would have done it in this order, but that's the order in which he wrote the chapter. So that's uh, uh, the order in which I'm going to do it. But uh, personally, when I'm putting data into database uh, tables, uh, I don't often do it using this first uh, set of uh, uh, features that we have here. OK. It's an important feature to know, but it's probably not one you're going to use every day. All right, so create table. So we create a new table from existing data that's in the database using the create a table statement. So, um, and we give it, uh, we say uh, create table, a table name as, and then we have a uh, select. OK, so we're going to create a table and we're going to populate it. And what are we going to populate it from? Well, from data that's already in the database. OK, so what if we wanted to create a complete copy of the invoices uh, table? Well, we could say create table invoices copy as select asterisk. That's all columns from invoices. OK, so then we would get a copy of the invoices uh, table with all the rows in it. And the columns would be named the same. OK, that sounds good. What if we wanted to make a partial copy? Well, we could uh, say, again, create table old invoices as, and then uh, we could say uh, select asterisk all columns from invoices where and they're old invoices because they've been paid. So this is the formula that we've been using in the last couple of chapters for uh, balance due. So when balance due equals zero, then uh, it looks like we want to be moving the invoices to old invoices. OK. Now, a couple things to mention here. One is that with this uh, second e example on the slide, uh, we may be uh, copying the old invoices to an old invoices uh, table. But we have, as of yet, we've never taken them out of the invoices uh, table. So now we've got two copies of them. And uh, perhaps in our workflow and record keeping, that's the thing that we would like to do. That might be OK. Um, but uh, perhaps if we really 
wanted to move things from invoices to old invoices at a certain point, we probably have to come up with a more sophisticated script that uh, uh, took things out of or um, copying things from invoices to old invoices and then uh, deleted uh, the things that we copied out of invoices, deleted them from invoices. Okay, so this isn't a total solution the way we see it right yet. Okay. Um, the other thing to consider is, um, whereas we copy the table, so we get a, we get a new table that has the same columns and the same rows. Okay, we haven't copied anything else. Okay, now we've learned about some of the database structures. Uh, like indexes and uh, uh, foreign key uh, relationships. Okay, we haven't learned how to implement them yet. We're not going to not going to learn how to do that for uh, chapter ten. But I just want to point out that when we create these things, when we create this uh, table, it doesn't have any indexes. Uh, uh, it it doesn't have uh, uh, foreign key uh, constraints. It's not a fully integrated into the system uh, table. It might be something that we could use for oh, some uh, quickie calculations or uh, something like that. But uh, we haven't really built and populated a table of the same quality as the original table, which had indexes and constraints and all that kind of stuff on it. OK. OK, now this is how to create a table with summary rows. Now, uh, we haven't gotten to the, the feature where we create uh, a summary rows. OK, uh, we'll be getting to that soon. And we do that with a feature called group by. Okay. Uh, so what we can do is we can actually summarize the data by vendor ID. Okay. So let's see, create table vendor balances from invoices group by vendor ID. So we're, we're coming up with, with a row for every vendor, no matter how many invoices they have. Okay. Or perhaps we're coming up with rows for only the vendors that have invoices, OK? And not the ones that don't have any invoices at all. Now, uh, this uh, group by feature will be a lot better understood when we get to the chapter in which we learn about summary queries, OK? But we could use that in order to create a summary table. And that might be, a, uh, you know, if in fact we are going to do a lot of summarization, that might be something that we would want to do to maybe speed it up. Okay, instead of doing a bunch of uh, queries in a row that do uh, that all do summarization, maybe we would run one uh, query like this one we see here that created a, a temporary kind of a summary table. And then we use that in order to get the answers that we wanted. OK, so that might be your motivation for uh, doing that. And again, uh, uh, you have to remember that this uh, doesn't have all of the kind of infrastructure that we might have in a table that we properly defined um, using uh, the tools that we're going to learn how to use in uh, chapter 10. It might not have all the indexes that we want or the uh, foreign key constraints. OK, uh, deleting a table. We could just say drop table old invoices. OK, now that's uh, 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 deleting a table uh, is a, a rather extreme way to get data out of the database. OK, and why, why would we do that? Maybe this is only a temporary table. OK, um, so uh, again, these are ways that we might be putting data into 
uh, the database or taking it out in some kind of a gross uh, sense without using the more usual um, SQL statements of uh, insert, update, and delete. So let's see if we can get ourselves to uh, the more usual things. So here, now we're into the more familiar use case. Uh, we're, we're working with insert, okay? So with the, with the insert statement, you can insert one or more rows into a table, okay? And uh, here we're seeing um, the first part of the slide, we're seeing a, a syntax uh, diagram so you can say insert into table, but the into is optional. So you could just say insert a, a, a table name. We're gonna learn that we have um, an optional column list. And how do we know it's optional? Well, it's got the square brackets around it, okay? And then we have the keyword values. And then inside parentheses, we have a series of values that represent the values that are going, to, are going to be put in each of the columns. Okay. Um, we're going to learn about the column list. We're going to learn how to do this with a column list, a column list, and without a column list. Um, but before we do that, let's just take a look at the column uh, definition for the invoices uh, table because uh, this is going to give us an idea about how the insert is uh, going to work. So is th are these the definitions from the AP database? Well, if they're not, they're close to it. Okay. So, um, and where would we learn, you know, the syntax for these statements? We're going to learn about it when we get to chapter 10. So we're only halfway there, okay? Well, why are we looking at them now? Well, because when you're doing uh, really inserts, updates, and deletes, you have to um, you have to conform to the rules of the database, right? So you have to insert thing insert things into into the columns that you have, uh, and many circumstances you have to insert a value for each of the columns so you have to know what the columns are what their data type is all those kinds of things right so what kind of uh, what kind of rules are there this is a sort of a, a preview from uh, chapter 10. let's see we say uh sorry <laughs> went backwards there we are we have an invoice id it's an integer it's not allowed to be null. It's auto incremented. Every time you insert a row, it goes one higher. Um, okay. The comma says, now the next column, vendor ID, an integer, it's not allowed to be null. Comma says, next column, invoice number, it's a variable length character fields up to 50 characters long. So from zero to uh, 50, it keeps track of how long the string that you place in that row in that column, how long that actual string is. It's not allowed to be null. Now when we have the invoice, so uh, dates a date, invoice uh, total is a, a decimal, nine digits overall, two digits to the right of the decimal point. Oh, dollars and cents. Payment total, dollars and cents. Um, payment total also says default zero. Okay. So if in fact you're not giving it a payment total, uh, then it'll put zero into the payment total. Credit total, uh, dollars and cents, not null, default zero. Uh, terms ID is an integer, not null. Invoice due date is a date, not null. Payment date is a date. Interesting, um, we've already been through this, I think, in chapter four. 
the payment date in the um, in in the invoices uh, table in the AP database it is allowed to be null. And what that means in this application is if it's null, then it hasn't been paid yet. Okay, if it has a payment date, we paid it on that date. Okay, so this is a preview of the uh, the schema um, uh, text for the vendors, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the invoices uh, table. We'll see more of that when we get to uh, chapter 10. Okay, so how would we insert a, um, a single row into uh, invoices? Well, this is probably the 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 way to do it with the least amount of code we say insert into invoices we didn't really have to say into but i i usually use into even though it's optional and then we say values okay you might remember that there's an optional uh, column list but we haven't given it so this is a very uh, kind of a terse and short version because there's no column list. And then in the parens, we have a value for each of the fields or each of the columns uh, that we are inserting for the row. Okay. So we've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's go back to the definition and see how many it had. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? So they have to match, okay? If you don't give a column list, okay, the column list is a, is a way to say, oh, I'm not going to give you all the values and or I'm going give to give them to you in some unusual order. If you don't have a column list, you have to provide a, a value for each of the columns and in the order in which they appear in the schema. Okay. So if we go back here, you can see that we have all of this. Now, um, what if you don't have a value? What if you want it to be null? Well, then you just use the keyword null. Okay, what if you wanted to take the default? Well, then you you can say uh, you can put in the keyword default. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. All right. So you can see we've got we've we've had to provide ten values, and if you took this list of values and you compared it to that little excerpt that we had from the AP schema, you would see that we've got a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the columns that we're expecting and uh, the values that we have in the values list, okay? And then we ran it and it said one row affected, that means it inserted that row in invoices. What if we wanted to use a column list? Well, how, why would you if you did, you know if you didn't have to well here are the use uh, cases you either want to provide the values in a different order and and or you don't want to provide all the values okay so hmm why what what if you didn't want to provide all the values don't you have to provide a value for every um, every column. No, you don't. In fact, you don't have to provide a value if it's allowed to be null and you don't provide a value, it gets a null. Okay. Uh, you don't have to provide a value if it's, if it has a, a default, then it'll take the default. Okay. So you don't have to provide them all. And maybe for some reason, uh, you're getting the data in uh, maybe not in the order that the columns occur in that table. And maybe you, um, it just seems more natural to put them in a different order. So you can put these 
column names in any order and it will match them up based on their name. Okay, it's polite to put them in the order in which they occur in the schema, but you certainly could change the order. So here, how many values are we providing? One, two, three, four, five, six. So four values um, are being uh, provided. Uh, they're being either null or defaults. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And if we went back and we looked at, at the schema, we would see that those four values are, are allowed to be either nulls or defaults. Okay. And we can see we had run one row affected. So we've inserted yet another row into invoices. Okay, let's go on. Insert multiple rows. So it's possible to insert more than one row with a single uh, insert statement. Why would you want to do that? Well, do you remember the do you remember the files that we use to load the databases that we work with uh, with the textbook or we also have a, a database that we uh, load called my guitar shop that we use with the exercises for this course? Well, um, if you look at the scripts that load the databases, they've got two things in them. One is that they've got a uh, statements that set up the schema for the database. But the other is that they have a lot of inserts that look just like uh, this. So they have like one insert that inserts all the rows for that table. Okay, so um, yeah, there's a use case right there. You've uh, kind of unloaded the table off of uh, one instance of, of the server and you're reloading it on the other instance. Okay, so this is going to be, this is going to do, it's got the values for, you look in the parens, right? So it has the values in the parens, you close the paren, you have a comma, then you go on to the next one. So that's one row, two rows, three rows, and when we executed it, it said three rows affected. So works pretty well. And because we didn't provide a column list, Okay, we have to provide a value for all 10 columns, and let's just count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Looks good to me. And the servers seem to like it, right? So that's good. Okay, now I just want to point out that uh, uh, it would be possible to, to insert multiple rows and have a column list. Okay, they're just not showing you uh, uh, both of these in any of the examples that are in the slides. It is a possibility though. Okay, so we're going to go explore based upon the schema rules for the table, uh, how certain inserts might work. Okay, how do, in particular, how things like uh, not null and uh, auto increment and default uh, work. So uh, here are the column uh, definitions. We have a color sample uh, table. It's got three columns, color ID, color number, color name. Color ID is an int for integer. It's not allowed to be null it has auto increment, okay? Color number is an int, it's not allowed to be null, it has a default of zero. And color name uh, is vercare 50, okay? We don't, it doesn't say that it's not allowed to be null, so by, uh, by implication, it is allowed to be null, and it has no default value, okay? Now, I just want to point out that in both of these uh, tables that we've looked at, both if we go back uh, two slides, three slides, 
uh, the invoices uh, table and then the color sample table. We have not said anywhere in here what the primary key is. Okay. Now we're going to learn how to do that when we get to uh, chapter 10. We're going to learn uh, more um, schema statements. Okay. In which we're going to be able to identify a primary key. We're going to be able to uh, do a lot of other things. We might say some value has to be unique. Um, we are going to be able to identify certain columns as being foreign keys, all that kind of stuff. Just to learn what we're learning here, though, uh, about which features of the um, which uh, features of the schema are going to, we have to worry about when we're doing inserts. Well, we're not going to look at that yet. So that's true for this um, invoices a table and also for this color sample uh, table. Okay, so let's look at what these uh, things are. So what they do here is that they show us one, two, three, four, five inserts. Okay. And then we go and we look at uh, the results. So we've got one, two, three, four, five rows inserted. Okay. And then we'll see what the results are. Okay. So let's go. So we're on the first the rows insert, or insert into color sample. Just the color number, value 606. Okay, so is the color number, okay, 606. Well, we had a color number. A color ID uh, uh, has an auto increment, so that's a default of a sort. That means the first row that we uh, we insert's going to get a one and the next one's going to get a two. So that's, that's a very fancy default. Okay. Color number we gave a value for. What about a color name? Uh, if we don't provide a value, can that be null? Yeah, that can be null. So let's go look at what we got. We got one because the, the auto increment. 606, we provided that value. The color name's going to be equal to null. Okay, that's pretty sensible. Let's go look at the next one. Okay, uh, so we provide, uh, we have a commonless color name. We provide yellow. So it's only the last one. Is there a default for color ID and color number? Well, color number is going to default to zero. And again, this auto increment is is... It's an implicit uh, default. So the last one was number one. This is going to be two. So I would expect uh, two, zero, yellow. Let's see what we got. There it is. Two, sorry, two, zero, yellow. That's good. Now the next one, we don't have a column list. Okay, which means that we have to provide all three columns in the order. And we say default, default, orange. Okay, well, that's fine. Is there a default for color ID? Yep, it's going to be three. Uh, there's a default for the second one, zero. And the last one's orange. So I'm expecting three, zero, orange. And let's look. Three, zero, orange. This is working. All right, so let's look at this. Uh, again, no uh, column list, so we're expecting three values. Default, 808, null. Okay, so I'm expecting four, 808, null. Let's look. Four, 808, null. That's good. And then the last one, no column list, so we need three. Default, default, null. So I'm expecting five, zero, null. Let's look. Five, zero, null. Okay? So once you sort of understand uh, how the rules in the schema language 
interact with these inserts, then you start to realize that there are, uh, based upon whether or not nulls are allowed or defaults have been specified either by explicitly by uh, default or implicitly by auto increment, well then various uh, combinations on your inserts are, are going to get uh, appropriate results in the database. Okay. Okay, now we are going to learn about subqueries here. Okay. Um, subqueries are a whole chapter. Okay. Remember a little while ago I said we had uh, summary queries and we had, we were using a summary query feature and I said, well, don't worry about it too much. We have a whole uh, chapter on uh, summary queries. Well, here I'm going to say uh, kind of a parallel thing. Uh, we're going to have a whole chapter on subqueries. Okay. So an alternative to giving a list of values is to code a select that produces a result set that can be used as a list of values. Okay. Well, then the values that come back have to be consistent with what it's expecting. So if we just, if we back up and we look uh, down here at the last one, the values are default, uh, default null. So it was expecting three values and the third one could be null and we got that. Well, uh, if in fact, in, instead of providing values, you were going to provide a select, well, again, it should provide the right number of columns and they should give values of the correct uh, type. Okay. So here we say uh, insert into invoice archive, select all columns from invoices where um, the balance due is equal to zero. So it turns out that the uh, we're going to assume from what we've already seen that the the uh, schema for invoice archive is the same uh, for invoice archive and invoices. It has the same number of columns and type. So that's exactly what we're going to get. And the only thing that we're really doing is we're filtering out everything that uh, doesn't have a balance um, balance to equal to zero. Okay. Okay. I don't know how I did that. I think I went the wrong way. I did. I somehow accidentally went the wrong way. Okay. Here we are. So here's the same statement with the column list. Okay. So what they did is that they, um, they listed uh, the columns. They gave a column list. And, they, and then they said select. And they repeated the column list. And then they said from invoices. And then they had the same. The balance due has to be equal to zero. Okay. Now, I believe that this both of the column lists are in the same order um, as they appear in the schema. Okay. So this just shows you that you could have it, uh, have it occur uh, in the same order as the schema. Uh, theoretically, you could uh, shuffle up the order on the column list, and then you could shuffle up the order of the columns in the select, and it would still work. Now, why you would want to do that, I, I don't know. They need to have a one-to-one -one correspondence, okay? If, in fact, you're going to have a column list up here, then it needs to be in the same order that you are retrieving these in the select. 
and these I, I think are just in the original schema order so it meets that requirement okay so those are the inserts all right um what about updates okay you know we just don't insert new data into your average um, the kind of databases we're learning about here are these online transaction uh, processing uh, databases in which an organization would keep their day-to-day -day, uh, records, okay? So uh, typically, you, just only, you, know, you don't only do ads, uh, you do ads and updates and deletes. So here's how you do the update, okay? So we, uh, here's the syntax a diagram. We say update table name set column name equal expression and then we can have more than one column name uh, set up to the number of columns that we have in that table and then we can have a where okay so what would that look like well update invoices set payment date equals uh, this date payment total equals the amount of the payment where invoice number equals and now this is only going to match a single row because it's um uh invoice number is not the primary key but it's a candidate key in that it's uh it's going to have a unique uh value okay so we're only going to update one row okay and uh, again, you can change as many of the values on that row as you want to uh, uh, when you do that. Okay. Update one column for multiple rows. Okay. Now, this would be kind of interesting if you wanted to change a whole lot of things at once. Like in the AP database, we have this thing, terms ID, which is the terms on which uh a vendor is extending us a credit and let's say let's say we called up the vendor or they call, uh, called us and they say let's say they called us and said uh you know we've been extending you a credit on it has to be paid within 60 days and you guys have been really bad payers we want to be paid within 30 days now because we have you guys uh we have you guys in the the penalty box okay and let's say the terms id for pay within 30 days was one well then we could we could come back and take uh, all of the invoices for vendor id equals 95 and we could set the terms id to one on all of them okay or you know likewise uh, let's say terms id 3 said we didn't have to pay till 90 days what if we called up and we cried poor and we said look you know we can't pay you on these you guys have to wait for 90 days and they said well you know we'll do it this one time for you because you're a good uh customer well maybe we would be setting them all to a uh, three so um a little more likely if we called them before they called us. Okay. Update one column for one row. Okay. So update invoice set credit total equals, and then we have a formula where invoice number equals, and then we've got that. Okay. So just a single value on um, a, a single column for a single row. Okay, Let's see what we can do here. Now, there is this thing called safe update mode. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to tell you, if you haven't gone and take a look at the tutorial that I have, I have a tutorial on setting the modes for MySQL correctly for my course okay and it's uh, it's a separate uh, tutorial at least in the current uh semester i have the link for that uh, tutorial right before this uh uh lecture okay 
So if you haven't uh, played that, you know, go and play that and go install the software and run the scripts and all that kind of stuff and then uh, come back. So one of the modes you can set for MySQL is a mode called Safe Update. Okay. What does it do? Well, it's possible to accidentally change more rows than you intended especially for the beginner okay so what this says is uh, and so it, when you install it it comes in safe update mode okay uh, by default my my sequel workbench runs in safe update mode okay uh, how does it do that? Well, it tells the server to enter safe update mode. Safe update mode prevents you from updating rows if the where clause is omitted or doesn't refer to a primary key or farm key column. Okay. Now, if you omitted the where clause, that would implicitly mean I want to do it for all the columns. Okay. Now, I, I'm sorry, all the rows. Now, is it possible that we want to update the the same column on all, all the rows? Yeah, but it's not an everyday thing that we want to do. And it might be something that we might accidentally do uh, when we were a beginner, or even if we've been out of the while, if we're distracted. Okay, so, um, and this is true when we get to, to uh, deletes as well. So what they do is they're trying to keep you as a beginner um, from hurting yourself by changing rows that you don't intend to change or deleting rows that you don't intend to uh, delete. So what they did is they came up with rules that said, well, you know, as long as they're following a certain rules, uh, we'll do uh, the update or the delete, okay? So it says, uh, if the where clause is omitted, then it won't it, it, it won't run the statement. Or if it doesn't refer, if we do have a where clause and it doesn't refer to a primary key or a foreign key column, then um, it's going to get too many rows, so we're not going to run it. And if you try to run one, it'll say, mm, I, I forget what the code is, but it, it says... Uh, uh, statement not run because of safe update mode. Okay. Now, are there, um, is this to have a good thing to have turned on? I think it is. Okay. Uh, if you're working with production uh, databases, okay, because in a real database, if you accidentally change too many rows, or if you accidentally delete too many rows, it's very hard to go and restore that, okay? Why is that hard to restore? Well, uh, typically we take a backup of it as we go, but if you want to restore it to a certain point, there's a lot of work that might include calling database administration, all those kind of things. It'd be a big deal, okay? So uh, having those things, having safe mode uh, turned on in Workbench uh, when you're working with production data, probably a pretty good idea, okay? Now, what about us in our course? Well, the fact is that we have a backup of all of our databases, okay? Because we have a script to load them, okay? And if we accidentally change or delete too much uh, data, what can we do? We can just go back and run the load scripts again. Okay, so this uh, safe update mode, whereas is, it's, it's a, a pretty good safety tool when you're working with production data, it's less important when you're working with learning data that uh, where the tables are all pretty short. They don't have a lot of rows which is our circumstances exactly in this course. So um, what I usually do is have you turn it off. And if you play the tutorial that I talked about a couple of minutes ago, I give you a script that sets 
uh, safe uh, update mode off. Okay, and there's a couple of other modes that it changes as well. And when we get to those, I'll point them out. Okay, now when we turn safe update mode off, that allows us to do updates or deletes that are not uh, based upon uh, either the primary key or foreign key fields. And we do actually have some exercises that are not based on uh, primary key or foreign key fields. Uh, I know we've got some situations in the final project that you can't get to run in safe update mode, okay? And again, safe update mode is a nice thing for you guys to remember, but maybe when you're working with production uh, data, okay? So we're gonna turn it off. How do you turn it off in Workbench? Um, so here's Workbench. Um, I believe in the, in this Mac version, you go up and you, you click on Workbench Preferences. In the Windows versions, I think you click on File Settings, okay? And you go into this Preferences, okay? And um, go to... Let me put you in a pause till I find the setting. Be right back. Okay, I found it. So I go to MySQL Workbench and I go to uh, Preferences. Again, that's how you do it on the Mac. And uh, I'm up in this general editors uh, category. The one I want is the SQL editor category. And then uh, down at the very bottom, it says safe updates. And because I've turned it off, it's unchecked. If I want to turn it on, I check it. Okay, so that's that's on. And when we turn it off, it's unchecked. Mine, I'm going to leave off for right now. Okay? Very good. Okay, so that's safe update mode. We're not going to worry about it a whole lot in our in our course, but it is something that you might want to have on uh, when you're working with your production uh, data. You don't want to accidentally change a million rows. You don't want to accidentally uh, delete a million rows, okay? Uh, here, if we uh, change or delete too many rows, we reload the database, okay? All right, where are we going? Here we are. So if we want to update all invoices for a vendor, we say update invoices, set terms ID equals one, where vendor ID equals, and here is a sub uh, query. So instead of giving it a vendor ID value, okay, we select vendor ID from vendors where vendor name equal Pacific uh, Bell. So again, don't worry too much about uh, how to make a subquery work because again, we've got a whole chapter on it, but uh, here you see the utility. You can actually use a name rather than a key value, which is pretty nice, okay? That should give you the motivation when we get to uh, subqueries. Um, here we can update the terms for all invoices for vendors in these three states. So we, sorry. Uh, here we are, we're back here again. Uh, update invoices, uh, set terms ID equals one, where vendor in, okay, so we're going to have a list now, and we're going to build the list uh, from a select vendor ID, so it's a vendor ID list from uh, vendors where the vendor state is is in the list, California, Arizona, Nevada. So this is a pretty sophisticated way uh, to control uh, what are um, what are the rows that we're going to update, okay? And we'll, we'll get more practice with this when we go to the chapter on subqueries. Okay, 
delete, right? Now, uh, I mean, obviously, if we keep inserting data, even if we update it, uh, we're going to get to the point eventually where we got too many rows, okay? And uh, uh, typically in these online uh, transaction uh, processing uh, databases, we keep the data for some length of time. Uh, here it looks like the users from the AP department probably want to keep these things. Uh, they probably want to keep, uh, uh, you know, the invoices for the current year. Um, and definitely they want to keep the invoices that haven't been paid yet. Okay, and exactly what the rules are for that, well, that comes from the business uh, requirement and what, what we've got the space to uh, store, right? But eventually, we're going to want to uh, delete rows, either because we've moved the data into some other table, some other database uh, where it's more appropriately stored, or it was a mistake. You know, we added a new customer and then we found out the deal fell through uh, and we just want to get rid of any trace of them, <laughs> okay? We don't want them on the customer list to remind us that we optimistically added them to the customers and only to find out that, um, that it was a problem. Or in this case with accounts uh, payable, let's say we had... Uh, we had a credit application with a supplier and they turned down our credit. So we couldn't order from them. Well, we don't want them on the list, you know, kind of rubbing salt in the wound all over and over again. We want to uh, delete that vendor uh, and never mention their name again, right? So delete. So let's see, it's got a pretty simple uh, syntax uh, diagram here delete from table name where search uh, condition. So to delete one row, delete from general ledger accounts where account number equals 306, okay? Because account number is a, a primary key, we know we're only gonna get one row at most. If we don't have an account number 306, then uh, we're going to get an error. If we've got 306, then we're going to get this one row uh, affected, and then the row is going to be gone. Uh, it delete one row using a compound condition. Delete from invoice line items where invoice ID equals 78 and in invoice sequence equal uh, 2. Okay? I think these are the two elements of a compound primary key, if I remember right. Okay. Um, what's next? How to delete multiple rows. Okay, so we're going to uh, delete from invoice line items where invoice ID equals uh, 12. Well, what's going on here? Well, probably we're going to, uh, we're trying to get rid of invoice uh, uh, 12. Maybe we entered it wrong. Okay, let's assume that, uh, yeah, maybe we entered it wrong. Maybe uh, somebody walked into the department with some fictitious invoice and it got left on a desk and somebody said, oh, you know, we should enter this. And it turns out that they should have never entered it. Well, what we're going to find out when we learn about these uh, foreign key relationships and this thing called referential integrity is that when we go to delete invoice uh, 12, okay, it's not going to allow us to do it if it still has rows and invoice line items that are pointing to invoice uh, 12. So what will we do first? Well, we'll go to invoice line items and get rid of all of the rows that are associated with invoice uh, 12. In this case, four rows. And then we would come right back after it and we would uh, delete uh, one row from invoices uh, where the invoice ID was equal to 12, okay? So when we have these foreign key relationships and we're maintaining 
referential integrity. We sometimes have to issue it deletes on um, multiple tables in the right order uh, to get rid of something like an invoice, which has invoice line items. Okay. Now here we're going to use a subquery and a delete. So delete from invoice line items where invoice ID is in. Select invoice ID from invoices where vendor ID equals one if 15. So it looks like we intend to get rid of all the invoices for vendor 115. So we're getting rid of the line items first, and then we're probably going to come back and get rid of all the invoices where the vendor ID is equal to 115. Okay. And I say here, warning, if you turn safe update mode off and omit the where clause from a delete, all the rows in the table will be uh, deleted. Okay, so that's why it's a wise idea to keep safe update mode on when you're working with real live production data. You don't want to accidentally uh, delete uh, a whole table's worth of uh, data, which in uh, the real world could be millions of rows. Okay, uh, and then it's going to take a whole long time for someone to recover from that. And there's going to be a lot of embarrassment and shame, okay? But for us, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, you don't have to turn on safe mode. Uh, when you do something silly like that, just go back and restore these learning databases, whatever database you're working with. And you may have to run a couple of previous exercises, but you'll be able to get yourself right back to the point where you were before you made the big mistake. And that is it, okay? Um, we're gonna talk um, in a chapter or two, we're gonna talk more specifically about doing inserts and deletes and updates when we've got these foreign key uh, relationships and we need to maintain, maintain referential integrity. These, uh, these examples in the deletes where we're getting rid of all the invoice line items for a particular invoice ID or for a particular vendor ID, that's a foreshadowing of something that we're going to cover in a chapter or two that says that when we're doing these, uh, these, uh, inserts and updates and uh, deletes, we have to remember that the foreign keys, uh, you can't break the foreign key rules, okay? We, we're not talking a lot about that here, but we'll be on to it in a later chapter. And with that, I'm going to say bye until next time. Bye-bye.